Hey everybody, this is Craig Garber. Welcome to Everyone Loves Guitar. And we got a really cool guest today, a special guy, Tom Gray from uh, Delta Moon. And um, he's an, a, Tom's a great songwriter, great blues player, and Delta Moon's a great band if you've never heard of them out of Atlanta. We'll talk about them. Let me give you Tom's background. Uh, he's one of the co-founders, primary songwriter, vocalist, and co-lead and lap steel guitarist for Delta Moon. As I mentioned, they're a really killer blues band out of Atlanta. Real old school, great tones. Uh, I mean, they, they just, you know, you can get up and dance or you could sit there and like, mm, you know, and grind, a, you know, feel the blues playing, man. Uh, Delta Moon's released 10 studio and two live albums between 2002 and before COVID hit. And they won the International Blues Challenge. They toured extensively throughout the U.S., Canada and Europe. Their album, Low Down, was named one of the year's best by both Downbeat and Blues Music Magazine. Tom and his co-guitarist and Delta Moon co-founder Mark Johnson make it a real joy to listen to the band. This is like a very pro-guitar band. Uh, Tom was named 2008 Blues Songwriter of the Year, and he's also a successful songwriter writing songs for other people. He wrote Cyndi Lauper's hit, Money Changes Everything. And his songs have been recorded by Manfred Mann, Carlene Carter, Bonnie Bramlett, and many others. His personal story, especially what he's gone through over the recent past, is uh, just incredibly admirable. And Tom's a warrior by anyone's standard. I'm sure if he chooses, we'll get into that later. Man, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate you coming on the show. Thanks very much, Craig. And thanks for that nice intro. You're welcome. Uh, so tell me, how did you first get started in the music business? And maybe what was your first break? My first break, well, it really depends how you look at it. In high school, I had a band. First, we just played in the basement, then some backyard parties, then started making a little money at some church dances and parties and stuff. And then after college, I started working in nightclubs six nights a week and did that for a few years, but it didn't really seem like it was going anywhere. At the same time, I was just learning a huge amount. I was playing with these other guys. Like I say, we're playing six nights a week, four sets a night. Wow. What's great? Isn't that great tuition? It is. It wow. is. And you learn what makes people dance, what makes people leave the room. <laughs> you know? What was the song that made people leave the room? Like, you, even if you loved it, you just couldn't play it. Uh, I don't think we had any that were that bad. But it, uh, it's just more in general, like uh, I remember Victor Wooten says, why does everybody get up and go to the bathroom during the bass solo? <laughs> 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 because the groove is gone. Yeah, the groove man. Disappears. So uh, it's, it's that sort of knowledge. And people I played with back in the bars then around Atlanta, people like Rick Price who played with me in the brains and then went on to play with the Georgia Satellites Keith Christopher, who uh, last I heard was working with uh, Leonard Skinner. You know, just a lot of people who uh, became professional musicians. Uh, just we all went to that same school. Barry Richmond, was he around at that time? I've known Barry for many years, but I never played in a band with him. Okay. No, I played a few gigs with him. Just a few, just a very few, but uh, not in his... Not in his band and not in my band, both when we were like subbing in the band. That's sure. It. Yeah. Okay, so you're playing six nights a week, and what comes next? Uh, well, there's only so many times you can play uh, some of these songs before you just can't stand it anymore. <laughs> That's just the way it was. Oh, yeah. And I, I want all this time I'm writing songs. I've been wanting to do my own songs. I had no idea how to do that. There were a couple uh, acoustic nightclubs in Atlanta where you could go in as a local on a Tuesday or Wednesday night and do some of your own songs. Uh, but that was about all I knew of. And then some friends of mine had a band called The Fans. And uh, they were going up to New York regularly playing in Max's Kansas City and CBGB and these clubs up there, they're getting written up in New York Rocker and uh, Variety Magazine, different things like that. Like, like they're real bands, you know, sure. <laughs> doing all original stuff. And so I got real interested in uh, these girl, old 
college friends of mine. So I went up to New York with them and uh, they played two nights at CBGB and there all the 45 covers on the wall behind the bar, all the people who played there. The first night that we were there was uh, the night before they played and uh, Alex Chilton was playing. He had Chris Stamey on bass. And uh, we went out to dinner with Chris Stamey after and just we're talking about uh, the scene there. And uh, it just seemed so exciting to me and I wanted to be a part of that. So uh, came back to Atlanta and Alfredo said, you're gonna have a band and it's gonna be called The Brains. And I said, well, okay, I'll do that. So in the meantime, I did some gigs with the fans because their keyboard player disappeared. And I was playing keyboards in those days. And I, I mean, I played a little guitar, mostly around the house, writing songs, that sort of thing, not really on stage. Uh, but uh, I did a few gigs in Atlanta with the fans, went out to LA with them. They had a record company showcase out there that they did. And uh, they ended up not getting the gig but I'm uh, not getting the record deal. Sure. But um, that was a, a really interesting band. I learned a ton working with them. And I started the Brains and my first gigs with the Brains were opening for the fans. My back in New first, York? Did you get to play back in New York? Yes, but as the Brains, not- That's cool. Played in Atlanta. The very first gig was uh, a place called uh, Great Southeastern Music Hall, and they had what they called their punk festival. And it was the fans, the brains, and the B-52s. Alfredo of the fans had talked the B-52s into getting out of Athens, where they were just playing private parties. And uh, their first gig outside of Athens was that one at the Great Southeastern Music Hall. And uh, there were some other bands from Atlanta, one called the Nasty Box. They were great. But anyway, that's a great what a what a great name man for a punk bucks. for a punk oh. band man. Oh man, what a name! Oh, the great quote was, "You nasty bucks are too nasty." <laughs> <laughs> but uh, Dan Baird was in that band. Dan was in there in, in the nasty bucks. Nasty bucks, yeah. That's hilarious. I had Dan on here. He's a great guy, man. Oh yeah, wow. He he didn't go as deep into the history as I did. I that's guess. amazing. But, uh, so. Uh, then we started headlining around Atlanta, but right the whole time from the start, I was focused on getting up to New York and trying to get a record deal. And our first time out of Atlanta, well, we did a show at this place called the Downtown Cafe, did two nights with the B-52s and took our money from that. And we went to Nashville and uh, recorded well we recorded it here and we had it pressed there um mastered and pressed in nashville pressed what does that mean <laughs> no i i know what it means but it's like it's like let me get my vhs you know my betamax yeah, i was telling a kid i'm going to the library yeah <laughs> what <laughs> but uh so we got uh we made that record and sent them out all over and uh Behind that, we were able to tour. Our first trip was up the East Coast. We played uh, Richmond, Philadelphia, New York. And we did a week in Montreal that trip. This is our first time out of town. That's, a, that's a good, nice road trip, man. Yeah, it's pretty good. There were, I think, a couple, of, a couple other cities. But it got so spread out, we ended up having to cancel some shows at the end because the drummer's father got sick and he wanted to come home. So uh, there was that. Then the, we were very fortunate. Uh, back in those days, there were still radio stations mm -hmm. and DJs. You might remember some of these terms. Uh, <laughs> they, would, <laughs> they would play seat of the pants radio and some big stations in big cities. Uh, KSAN in San Francisco was mm -hmm. a huge one for us because they were being taken over by uh, a conglomerate. 
that was going to uh, change the format. And uh, there would be no more seat of the pants DJs. Uh, so that summer, Money Changes Everything became their theme song on the radio. All the DJs played it because they're all losing their jobs. Right. And that was their way of making a statement there. And uh, I talked to so many people from San Francisco who said, man, that was the sound of that summer. You couldn't escape that song. And so that worked out really well for us. And then as the DJs, I, I know I say it worked out well and they lost their jobs, which is not right. But uh, as they- No, but as a song, yeah, it worked out yeah. well for you guys. And then they left KSAN and went all over the country and uh, took the record with them and played it on different radio stations where they had new jobs. So I remember uh, Kate Ingram went to New York, I mean, to Boston, played it on, uh, uh, there were a couple stations there in Boston that picked it up. There's a big one in New York that started playing it. Different, you know, large stations around the country where you could still get a, an independent 45 played. So that worked out well for us. And we kept going to New York and doing these showcases and finally got a deal with Mercury. And they hired uh, Steve Lillywhite to produce that record. And uh, we chose him on the basis of the drum sound on an XTC record. So that's the snare sound we want. So- uh, Oh, he, wa he was, was he, he wasn't Steve Lillywhite at that point in time? Well, he'd done- oh an XTC record he'd done, uh, he came straight to us from uh, having done P Peter Gabriel album. Okay, so he was on, well on his way. Yeah, and then he went from us. He said, I got this bunch of 17 year old kids in Dublin I'm gonna do a record with. And of course it was you too. But right. he hadn't met them yet when he, uh, when he left our record and went to uh, produce their first record. Uh, so, uh, Learned a lot from Steve, too. He did two records with us for Mercury. But I'm getting ahead of myself just a little bit, if you just bear with me. Just uh, that first record on Mercury. He said, usually, when I'm doing an album, this is the first one I've ever done where nobody from the label has come to visit the studio. I haven't even had a phone call from anybody. But what had happened was Mercury was bought up by Phillips in Germany. Okay. And everybody on the label, from the receptionist to the CEO, was fired. And all brand new people came in while uh, we were in the studio. This was for the first record. Yeah, just as we were going in. And as it turned out, some of the people turned out great for us. Some of us, some of them didn't care for us so much. Mm. So it uh, second record didn't get much push at all. And because of the new regime. I think so. Oh, yeah, I don't absolutely. want to say it's anybody's fault because some of those people were really wonderful. Uh, Peter Lubin, especially there. was. We were in New York, totally broke. Why do and, I know his name? Uh, he was a writer. He's done a lot of things with a lot of labels. Okay. He's been around. Yeah. I'm not sure what he's doing now. But I just remember it was like, 17 degrees on New Year's Day. And we finally ju had just enough money to check out of the hotel from having play open for the Kinks the night before. Wow, where was that? Like at, at the Palladium in New York. That's so Remember? cool. Was it, yeah, felt, was it the Felt Forum maybe? Wasn't it the Palladium that was down there on uh, 14th on Street? On 14th Street, yeah. Yeah, sure that's was. where it was. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and we'd done a King, uh, Kinks tour in the spring. Uh, they did the uh, live double album, One for the Road. I yeah, think. that was great we, record, man. We opened every one of those shows. What were those, if, if you don't mind, what were those guys like? With, with it, you know, you, if, when you, if you read, you don't know what to believe. All I remember is every article would mention the Davies brothers fighting. Kind of like the, the Robinson brothers of yeah. the 80s or the, you know. Yeah, I was never a witness to them fighting. Yeah, they okay. were witness to us fighting. So, but, <laughs> but they would, when we, sometimes when we were on the same plane with them, they would both sit in first class, but one at the front of first class and one at the back of the 
first class. Oh, and good. they would get out and go out and get in separate cabs to go to the same hotel where they had separate rooms. I mean, you know, oh, we were, we were <laughs> in parallel, but yeah. not exactly together. Yeah. But they, they knew how to do it. And uh, it was a big thrill for me. It was about a week into the tour. Uh, walking backstage and here comes Ray Davies walking the other way. And he says, hi there, mate. <laughs> That's so cool. Boy, this, this totally made my week right here. That just They were a great band. I, I, they had some great hits, man. I really liked that band. Really did. And I learned so much from watching them night after night because so much you think is spontaneous and you realize it's really a show. It's show business. They know what they're doing. Uh, and they know how to make it look spontaneous, but uh, at the same time, there's a plan behind it, and they know how to make it a really good show that people would enjoy. Can, can you so give an I, example? Uh, yeah. Uh, and I don't know if I should tell stories like this out of school, but this was an education for me. At a certain point in this show every night, Ray Davies would run off stage, pull his shirt tail out in the back, and then run back on stage. That's his costume change. That's his costume change, all right. <laughs> Another point they do, uh, he'd get up to the front of the stage just by himself and play the intro to Lola. Bum, bum, ba -da -da -da, ba -da, and then he'd just stop and say, no, I don't feel like doing that tonight. And the whole Oh, that's thing, the whole place would just go. Ah. That's really wow. clever, man. Yeah, and he'd say, "You really want to hear that?" And they'd say, "Yeah." And he'd say, "Okay, especially for you guys, we'll do it tonight." That is so clever. <laughs> yeah, and he did that every night. That is great. Uh, so that was an education to me. Yeah, definitely. What happened ultimately? with the band with the brains because you know was it you think it was the the, the lack of support from the label because i've heard this is such a common thing well that was a common thing we did an ep after that on landslide records and we even had a video on mtv but uh we went on tour which we love to do maybe too much uh we were out in california we were going up, we were in LA, we were going up the West Coast to Vancouver and then coming back across Canada. Uh, I guess we would have gone around the shield and come down, uh, yeah, I think then back in the US in Detroit and then uh, come back over to the East Coast and back down to Atlanta. That was the plan. So we're in, uh, LA and my lawyer calls from New York and says they've canceled all the Canadian dates. I never understood why or what was going on. But that left us with two weeks wide open, no money coming in. Mm. We had a rental truck, we had hotel rooms, all this stuff. So uh, our booking agent was really scrambling, which they sometimes had to do, uh, picking us up like uh, little dates, like a, a lunch show on a quadrangle at some college in the Los Angeles area or something like that. Sure. So we'd make just enough money. And yeah, something is better than 100%, 50% of something is better than 100% of zero, exactly. right? Exactly. Yeah, our hotel bills. And right. Enough to eat on. And then what does he got for us the next day? Yeah. It was like that. It went on for several days. And then finally we said, we just can't do this. And so we drove from L.A. to Dallas, where we slept on a French floor, and then got up and drove the rest of the way, of the way to Atlanta, which was about 3,000 miles. Yeah, man. That's it's insane, I know. But what else could we do? Got home. I had the rental truck the hotel bills, all of that was on my personal credit card. So I had to start pulling that out of the gig money uh, to try to pay some of that as we're playing that 
gigs around just around the south on the weekends. We're doing coliseums and little towns or colleges, this sort of thing, within a few hundred miles of Atlanta on Friday and Saturday night and paying the guys the best I could, but I also had to pay these bills. So what happened was the guys weren't being paid enough. And the bass player went out on the road with Steve Marriott without any warning to us. And then, and then Morrow Magellan was drumming with us then. And he went with the satellites who became the Georgia satellites. Sure. We're, we're in the process of becoming the Georgia satellites. Rick Price was playing guitar with the brains. And it got to where it was just me and Rick and a woman who worked with us named Doreen Cochran. And the three of us sat down in this little bar over near Emory University, sitting there in this corner in the dark, saying, you know, do we want to continue with this? Where are we with this? And we all agreed it's done. Yeah. So what that did, Rick then immediately said, well, I've got to tell you, the satellites had already contacted me about playing bass with them. So, uh, but it was all on the up and up and friendly. Uh, but I was stuck with the bills on my credit card. Oh, man. Yeah, so I'm out mowing lawns. And cutting was, was, was it, were any residuals coming in or from, from Money Changes Everything? Well, it wasn't a hit yet for Cindy. Oh. She'd recorded it, but it... Uh, it hadn't been out. It hadn't exploded it hadn't yet. Been out. Yeah. It, it, during that year, which was 83... Her record came out. I'd, I'd had some other cover songs, you know, in the last few years before that, and there, nothing really happened with them. And I liked Cindy's record, but I didn't expect anything like what happened. Yeah. And uh, I started writing some for the newspaper, writing features for the Sunday magazine that they had at that time. All this stuff's gone. I know it's, it's um everything it's it's crazy to think like this is not a long time ago, man. In the no, big picture not. of the world, or even of the United States. Mm -hmm. So I'm I'm mowing lawns during the week and well all the time and trying to write a few articles, which were good too. And we're in education. I went up to Asheville and met Bob Moog and spend a day with him. You know, that was a nice article. From Moog Synthesizers. Yeah. Oh, that's cool. And, uh, Stanley Booth, who uh, had just written a book about the Rolling Stones called uh, Dance with the Devil. Uh, he was down in South Georgia and he and I <laughs> went all around in South Georgia in a arena in Buick, drinking constantly. And <laughs> that was <laughs> <a lot of> fun. <laughs> so, uh, um, these things were happening, but I was still pretty broke and I just got married too, which was kind of working. It was working out well, I mean, but uh, the marriage was, but we were pretty tight. Money was tight. Are you still married to the same person? Yes. Yes. To the same woman. How many years, man? So 83? That was 84. So that's 30, 37 years. Correct. Man, congratulations. Well, thank you. Dude, I got goosebumps. That's pretty awesome. Yeah, she's she's been a good helpmate. I've got to say, we make a good pair. That's awesome. Yeah, man. Very cool. Oh, thanks. So one night, we're living in this little apartment with real thin walls. <laughs> uh, the neighbors on both sides. On one side, we had these two gay guys we called Ronald and the master because it was like, Ronald, I'm the master of this house. <laughs> so, <laughs> we heard that quite a lot. Okay. On the other side, there were two guys that just screamed at each other the whole time. And uh, one night they're over there screaming. Also, they played their records way too loud. And one night they're over there screaming and they're playing Cindy Lauper's record and they're playing my song way too loud. And I think, you know, I think this is going to work out. <laughs> oh, so you had like a, like the, the light starts shining in a little bit at that point. 
yeah, yeah. Once my neighbors were bothering me on their stereo with my own record. Yeah, that's pretty cool, <laughs> man. So then we went, we went on from there. The money started to come in. So I went to New. Of course, I met Cindy. Went to New York and wrote some songs with her that were on uh, some other albums. I had a song on True Colors. Plus, there were still singles in those days. And Money Changes Everything Live right. was the inside of True Colors. So that was a good lick. And uh, wrote some with Cindy and went, wrote some in Nashville with various people and out in L.A. Still living in Atlanta, but I'd be gone for a month or two at a time. How did you get, how did these people like in that, did Money Changes Everything spread around? You started getting calls from publishing companies and other writers. Is that how that worked? Uh, more for me, just getting around and meeting people, you know, and they, and they knew you wrote money changes everything. And then yeah. all of a sudden you're like shining light is like, yeah. Sometimes yeah. people would contact me, uh, but it was mostly with people that I knew or that somebody I knew knew, you know? Yeah, sure. Uh, and like, and all this, I didn't look at this like a business even like probably as I should have. A lot of times I was just having fun. Uh, like a Isn't that the nature of this industry, this business though? Nobody, uh, you know, I, I had one guy interviewed and I'll say who it was because he talked about it. Dave Mason uh -huh. was the only guy I've ever heard that said, I wanted to write hit singles and I knew how to write them. Yeah. People, nobody goes and says, man, I want to make a bunch of money. Let me be, let me be a musician. You know, it's like you got this passion and yeah, you just had it for fun. There's a lot of craftsmanship in writing a song. Yeah. It, it just doesn't come out of the air. You got to learn what works and what doesn't. But, you know, the more you do, the better you get at it. Sure. And uh, I just, I don't know. For instance, in Nashville, I got, <coughs> I worked with some of the uh, really middle of the road kind of Nashville people. And, uh, learned a lot from working with him. Uh, people who'd had a song in the country charts for the last 12 years, you know, constantly. Uh, but uh, then also I got hooked up with, uh, through my friend Keith Christopher, met Carlene Carter. And through her, it was just fun. It wasn't like, okay, I can make a million bucks now if I meet Johnny Cash. No, it wasn't like that. But I did meet Johnny Cash and I met June Carter Cash. What was Johnny like? He really impressed me. I learned a good bit from him. Just because the only time I met him was at, at June's book signing when she'd written her autobiography. And he was there and it was at a mall in Hendersonville, I think. And uh, I went there with Carlene and, she, and Johnny was out in the middle of the mall. He had a crowd of men, a circle of men all around him. And June was inside at a table signing books. And she had women all around her. <laughs> yeah. But June, I mean, uh, Carlene introduced me to Johnny. And he said, glad to meet you. You know, just being polite. And we stayed there about a half an hour. And then Carlene says, OK, I got to get out of here. I said, OK, I'm with you. So we went back out in the hallway there. And Johnny's still out there with this crowd of men around him. And Carlene kind of waves to him over the men's heads. And then he, uh, he calls out to me. He said, so long, Tom. It was good to meet you. <laughs> my God. That's pretty impressive. I didn't even remember my name. Yeah. I said, if he can do that, I mean, that's, that's what it is to be a star, to do that. So I started trying to do better at remembering people's names after that. It's a hard thing to do when the greater the amount of people that you have oh for sure for sure but i never realized how much it would mean yeah well, johnny cash remembered my name that's so cool yeah that's very cool um i, I just i'm sorry to go back and forth atlanta did you ever play with peter stroud sure i know peter yeah uh, i played with him never played in a band with peter but i've known him for years did a show with him Let's see, which one was it? Uh, a couple of years ago, I haven't played a show in a year and a half, at least. Sure. 
Um, I did a show with him with uh, Kevin Kenny and Driving with Crying. I don't know if you're familiar with Kevin. I'm not familiar with Kevin, but I know the band Driving and Crying. Yeah, yeah. it's Kevin's band. And uh, Peter played. I think that was the show I played with him. Anyway. Yeah. Anyway, uh, I'm pretty sure. Yeah, it was. That was it. Lovely so guy, did, man. Yeah, really. did, yeah, we did two nights. Yeah. So that that was great. That's so cool, man. Uh, okay, so I want to ask you about money changes everything. And I'm sorry, because I know you've been asked about this a hundred times. I hope this is the only question that I'm going to, I'm going to be redundant with. Um, you can stop me from talking, so go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> I know, man. It's your interview. You got to talk. What was your story reference from Money Changes Everything? And, and how did Cindy wind up picking it up? Well, okay. That's a couple of questions. When I wrote the song, you mean the story that inspired the song? Yeah. Yeah. Like what was, yeah. Well, how did that pop? You know, what, well, was, was that talking, just teen or was that just youthful angst? No, it was, I was talking with my landlady who was also an old friend who uh, happened to buy, she happened to buy this house and rented me the downstairs, but we would get together sometimes and talk and we're talking about gossiping really about people we knew. And she said, well, as soon as, as soon as she finds somebody with money, she's gone. She's going to leave him far behind. And I said, you know, I think there's a song in there. And then money changes everything popped in my head. And I said, excuse me, I got to go downstairs. And I went downstairs, I had a piece of music on the piano and I started banging on it. And I wrote the song in about an hour. That's um just off that conversation. Yeah. That's so great. That's where that came from. And then how Cindy got it. Uh, of course, I'd recorded it with the Brains. She did her first album. Uh, I had a split publishing deal on the Brains' first two albums with a company in New York called ATV. And uh, Marv Goodman and ATV pitched the song to Rick Chertoff, who was her producer of her first album. What she later told me was, uh, well, he pitched it for Rachel Sweet, actually, who passed on it. And then, uh, then Cindy told me that they about had their album done, but Rick said, you need three cover songs to fill this album. So, uh, that's a weird statement. Well, maybe that's not, I wasn't there. Yeah, but isn't, I mean, that's, that's what I remember. That he yeah, said. yeah. Well, you don't, three, so, not two, not four. Well, he might not have been that precise. But yeah. You know, what it turned out to be. Yeah, yeah. And uh, well, maybe it was two. I don't know. Man, I got wrong. <laughs> but uh, he gave her a cassette. It's another old time word. You look it up if you. Compared. All these words, cassette, royalty, library. Yeah. <laughs> library, that's where you have to go to look these things up. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, he gave her a cassette of, I think, five songs. And she chose, maybe it was two, because I just remember Money Changes Everything and a Prince song, When You Were Mine, were the two that she chose. Yeah, I don't think there was three. So I don't know, my math's off. But at any rate, that's how she chose that. And uh, then after the record came, uh, the first single was, of course, Girls Just Want to Have Fun. And then I get people calling me every couple months from New York. Oh, I've talked to so-and-so, and your single's next. Your song's the next single. And uh, that went on for three or four more singles <laughs> until it finally money changes everything was a single which i'm glad that all the earlier ones did so well that they got that deep into the album that's phenomenal man uh, how how uh, not i don't mean money i don't mean like i'm not asking you how much money you made but how did that change your life like um well it's very ironic and strange at first, because it takes nine months or a year for any royalty money to get back to the writer. Mm. 
And uh, I know friends of mine in Nashville <laughs> talked about, I think that BMI now will win on a chart position, but they would talk about going to the bank, trying to get a loan saying, look, I got a number one record. Yeah. That's my right there. You know, just, you lend me the money and I get paid. That's like having a, this is my, it's like having, uh, like you're securing an asset, like you're a mortgage or something like that. Right, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's right, that bank future said. promise of asset. Yeah. Yeah. So I, mean, I didn't, even tried to go to a bank. I waited until I got a check, which was worth waiting for, but it took quite a while. Yeah. I'm assuming your wife was thrilled as well. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's good. That's a nice story, man. That's a real good story. Um, what happened right after the brains and before you and Mark connected to form Delta Moon? In there, well, I did the traveling around the songwriting. I did, uh, I played around some Atlanta, some with some bands, especially because in the uh, Brains, I was, uh, I, I did not play guitar in the Brains. I played keyboards. And, uh, but I'd gotten in the late 80s, I just picked up a lap steel and just loved it. I couldn't put it down. So uh, I picked up some more lap steels and I kept playing them. And I started finding these old guys and learning uh, from them. And uh, of course, David Lindley was a huge influence in those days. Right. But getting out, getting out and playing myself that instrument it was kind of like starting over in a lot of ways. I had to sure. these little barbecue joints and coffee shops in Atlanta, either alone or by my uh, or with with somebody else. Uh, did some duos. Uh, then I finally started playing with an electric band around Atlanta, and then uh, I had a son, uh, and I stayed home a couple of years and pushed the stroller around the neighborhood, stopped traveling for a little while. And I was a diaper changing daddy. And then uh, went from that, uh, oh yeah, I still- I was, was that a conscious decision? Oh yeah, oh yes. To, to stay oh, home we wanted to have a kid. Yeah. Just as you were talking about earlier. And uh, then uh, having the kid, yeah, my wife was working. She had a regular income. Which saved our lives. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, she was a teacher, which is saving my life now because I've got insurance. Yeah, thank goodness, man. Yeah. But I got the bill the other day. Off topic, I know. <laughs> dollars so far this year in chemotherapy. You owe zero. <laughs> yeah. yeah. How good does that feel <laughs> when you see the you owe zero? Holy crap. But I'll tell you what, man, you know, it's a real joke. The amount they charge insurance companies is like eight to 10 times what they charge regular if you don't have insurance. Yeah, but the insurance companies can deal with them and talk them down, which a regular citizen can't do. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Uh, but at any rate, so yeah, I was being the dad. Uh, Mark Johnson lived just a couple blocks away from me. Uh, in fact, I was out uh, pushing my son on the swing or the slide or something there in the neighborhood. Mark came by and said, you want to do a show up here at this, uh, at this little place here a couple blocks away? I said, sure. Uh, so we started doing that, started playing uh, some little coffee shops and, and some small bars around Atlanta as a duo and then as a trio with Jim and Lee singing with us. And then as a quartet, we had a percussionist for a while, but he moved away to Gulf Shores, Alabama. This is too much detail, I know. Uh, so no, man, you're fine. We, uh, I'm impressed with your memory. I'm like, I don't remember someone, what they did if I met them yesterday. Oh, okay. 
<laughs> keep going. Keep going. This is impressive. <laughs> so at any rate, we uh, started playing these places. Not every weekend, but got to where it was most weekends. And then we got a regular Monday night gig at a barbecue joint. And started really working up a repertoire. And there's a different band every Monday. I never knew who was going to be there. Uh, which was fun too. Uh, I had I, I played piano and the lap steel, and uh, I would stand up with the lap steel, but the piano I had to sit, and a crash cymbal is like right here in my ear. Uh. There was a different drummer every week, and some were pretty considerate, and some <laughs> were not. Some were killing me. So, but anyway, we worked through that, and then we moved from Monday nights there to Tuesday nights, this is a step up, and it paid better too, at a blues club here called Blind Willies. And then we we developed a regular Tuesday night clientele, the same people were coming. They had their regular seats, their regular tables. And we started filling it up on Tuesday. So they moved us to Thursday for a short while, and then we started playing weekends there, Friday and Saturday nights, and selling the place out. So. That all worked pretty well. And about that time, too, we did our first album, our first CD. Let's call it an album. Well, it was a CD. At any rate, and then uh, we went to Memphis and won that IBC. I'm getting way beyond the scope of your question now, but this is how Delta moved. Yeah. It just kind of gradually started. And people would ask me and Mark, when did you guys start playing together? And we'd say, well, we're not sure. Sometime between 95 and 2000, maybe. <laughs> you know, we didn't know. Uh, we just, it was just gradually. But how did you go from, this is very unusual, because like, the Brains were like an alt slash punk band almost, right? Yeah, I guess you could say that. I never knew what to call us. Well, it was in that range somewhere in that yeah. ocean, right? And, you know, Delta Moon is a blues band. You, you generally don't find someone switch from that deep in one genre to another. Like maybe they go from Americana to blues or so, or I hate the word Americana, but you know, rock to blue. You went from a, like a, everything. What, how did that even happen? Or, or was it the, was it the lap steel that sort of. Lap steel had a lot to do with it, but I was right. listening to a lot of old country guys, Hawaiian players. Slack key guys. So, yeah. And, but also the Hawaiian steel guitar players, a lot of them played both, like Gabby Patanui. Mm. Uh, uh, but I listened to all these guys, but I wasn't playing any of their styles exactly. Mark was playing strictly blues. And since he was doing that. He's a hell of a slide player, man. Yeah. So oh. we started just focusing Delta Moon down that lane, you know. Not that I quit playing the other kinds of music. But Delta the moon, it was what I was playing every night. And that was uh, my meal ticket, I guess. Although it didn't buy me a lot of meals. <laughs> <laughs> so, that, so once this, once you got your first album, and you, things just—it it sounds like this was like again, once again, you didn't go after the. This was just something that you you started doing for joy. Yeah, true. I would and, say true. Because Mark and I would just get together and play in the living room. Or in my studio, we just get together and play, and uh, we'd show each other stuff and have fun. And we were doing this for quite a while, and then Mark went down to Jazz Fest in New Orleans and saw uh, Ry Cooter and David Lindley playing together. Now they weren't playing slide at the same time. If one was playing slide, the other would be playing more of a standard guitar or whatever kind of instrument Lindley was playing at that time. But uh, but he said, well, that's basically what Tom and I do. So he came back all excited and said, we can get out and do this in front of people. I said, why not? So we started doing it. And nobody was really doing exactly that. So we yeah. had our own little niche there. And then in 2003, we went to the IBC in Memphis, the International Blues Challenge. Now, we tried out for it in 2002 and failed at the local level mainly because 
we had a gig that afternoon. They wanted us to play at one and we were supposed to do a show at a festival in Rome, Georgia at three. And I was going like, let's get uh, out of here. We got a paid gig. And uh, which was not the smartest thing in the long run, but maybe we just weren't ready yet. But funny how that worked out. It's good that it, you had the gig, man, in yeah. a way. I mean, the next year you came back and you won. Yeah, we came back the next year much more serious about it. Uh, still a little, uh, not completely serious, but much more serious about it, especially at the local level. And uh, then uh, we got to Memphis. We saw the first band. Oh, they're out of Ohio, Johnny somebody, I forget. But they were really good. And we're going, oh my God. Uh, then we had to go on after them and do our show. Uh, with the way they would do it, you would be in the club on Beale Street two nights in a row, and there would be like four or five bands each night. Um, and there was a panel of judges who would judge you and make notes on your performance every night. And uh, that's not stressful. Yeah. And, you know, <laughs> then the, from each venue, the winner from each venue then on Saturday night was in the finals, which they had in the New Daisy Theater. And, uh, and and then the, uh, there was a bigger panel of judges there, and they would choose the winner. And uh, darn if we didn't win the whole thing, but uh, it was it was a little stressful. It was a lot of fun. And now, I was that just the two of you, or was that the full band? No, that was a full band. Okay. At that time, we were playing Blind Willies on Tuesday. I didn't mention that the, when we went to Tuesday at Blind Willies, the whole band got louder. We had a regular full drum kit and a, an electric bass player. And I don't think we ever did it without that anymore. Right. Uh, so, yeah, there was something else I was going to say, but I'm sure I said quite enough. So, <laughs> to ask no, it's good. Um, do you do, do you play regular electric at all with Delta Moon, or is it only lap steel? No, I played regular electric. So yeah, that's, that's what I thought. More acoustic. Acoustic, yeah. Record. Yeah. Uh, but anything I played acoustic on the record, I would play electric live just because it's too much hassle to carry too many too many guitars, especially when you're flying to Europe a lot, which we ended up doing. Uh, the last several years of Delta Moon, we were in Europe. Oh, three or four months out of the year. And uh, and that's going over there maybe three times, uh, doing five, six, seven weeks at a stretch. And uh, we go in the spring, in the summer, and in the fall. Each one of those would be a festival season in a different country, pretty much. Uh, so we worked all over, over there. Uh, but it was just too much. I got to where my, uh, the instrumentation I was taking with me was based on what I could carry in one trip. Which makes sense. Yeah. That's a, it's a, that's a haul, man. Yeah. And then you're driving around in them tiny little roads in Europe. Yeah, there's that too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, where did you grow up originally? Because I don't, it wasn't in Atlanta, was it? No, I was born in Washington, D.C., grew up in Arlington, Virginia. My dad worked for the Southern Railway. And uh, when they moved their headquarters to Atlanta, we all moved here. I was 13. The family moved to Atlanta then. And I was probably the one who hated it the most. And Today, I'm the only one still here. Which, it's funny how that works out, isn't it? Uh, but it hasn't been so bad. What was your growing up like? What was your childhood like? Like, how did you get into music? I had a pretty normal childhood. There was a piano in the house, but there wasn't much music in the house. My mother had a couple Ernest Tubb 78s that she claimed were not hers. <laughs> <laughs> that was about it. We had a Christmas album, I think. 
And uh, my dad got some more. I remember we went to Maryland and got it, probably for next to nothing, if not nothing. An old record player that had uh, four speeds on it went all the way down to 16. And we love no, that's not around anymore either. This is going to be oh, called the, the nostalgia call with Tom Gray. <laughs> yeah, I love playing. We loved playing those uh, Ernest Tub 78s on 16. We thought that was the coolest thing. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, there wasn't much music in the house. My parents liked the radio that was mostly news. Although I do remember my mother telling me when I was a kid. She had the radio on and there was a woman singing some kind of love song. And I said, why are all these songs about love? And she says, I guess that's because that's what makes people feel like singing. <laughs> so, it's funny how you remember that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Obviously had a pretty big impact on you. It's funny, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. So that's, that was my childhood growing up. We had a piano though. I was self-taught. I had a few piano lessons in first and second grade. And I had my old clarinet my dad had bought when he was uh, working for uh, some kind of forestry thing before the war. So, and Benny Goodman was big. He showed great taste there. But he bought the clarinet. And uh, he used to sometimes bring it out when I was a kid at night and play Deep Purple. Was On clarinet? Yeah. <laughs> was it a metal clarinet or a proper wooden clarinet? That was a proper wooden clarinet. Yeah. And I played that with the eighth or ninth grade bands or something like that. Sure. I wasn't really a clarinetist at heart. I was banging out the rock and roll songs on the piano at home, which would make my mother come in and say, why don't you take a walk? So, <laughs> and so, then uh, finally got a Farfisa organ and a Silvertone 12 amp. And we started having band rehearsals in the basement. Went on from there. So even though they weren't musically inclined, they were supportive of your interest in music? Well, once they saw I actually made some money in it, they got a lot more supportive. Right. So they, yeah, they were supportive. They yeah. Were, I would have all kinds of people come over and play in the basement. The one, the one time my mother comes down the stairs going, I can't stand it anymore. <laughs> but, uh, but most of the time she put up with it. Yeah, that's nice. But it, it sounds like, though, you always knew you wanted to be a musician. Pretty much. Uh, I wish I had a more romantic answer. Like, I know my boy when he got about six years old, somebody asked him what he, what he wanted to do. He said, either an astronaut or a knight. An astronaut or a knight. What a cool yeah. answer. Yeah. Why, wow, you go, man. You go. Yeah. yeah. But I, I I didn't go there. That was his. He ended up doing it. But anyway. He didn't become a knight? Eh, maybe in his own mind sometimes. <laughs> Uh, to whatever extent you're comfortable, Tom, what were some of the low points or dark periods you've had to deal with and how'd you get through them? I would have to say the cancer has been the lowest. Yeah. The first time I had, I had colon cancer and we were over in Europe at Delta Moon and I knew that something was wrong. It was hurting more and more every day. Finally, we we're flying from Copenhagen back to Atlanta. And I just remember, you know, at the doctors, sometimes if you go in and you're sick or something, they ask you, do, are you in pain? On a scale of zero to 10, where's your pain? And I had no idea. I had no idea what it would be like up around 9 to 10. Yeah, that's a problem. Yeah. Because they do ask you that. Yeah. Yeah. Now my answers are much different than they would have been before that happened. I would have thought, what I would have thought of as a 10 now, I think, is, oh, that's a, like a four. Yeah. 
that was pretty bad. And then came home and had to go through customs and everything. And then went to the hospital. And they ended up taking my colon out, although it took a while. But the surgeon told me that I was as close to rupture as she'd ever seen anybody, which would have been fatal. Oh my God. How long were you hospital? How long were you hospitalized for? That I have no clue. I really don't remember. Uh, days, weeks, I don't know. Because I was in a couple times. What year was it? A colectomy. And then I had to wear a bag for a while. That was pretty grim. And then after 10 months of that, went back in and they reconnected me. And I thought everything was cool. And then went in for another test. The doctor calls me up and said, guess what? It's come back. And it's just going to keep coming back. So uh, we need to take out your whole colon. And so I'm, I know this is unpleasant. But they did that. And then I went for 10 years. OK. It was a big change of lifestyle. Touring without a colon is very different. Diet's very different. Just uh, your, whole, your whole daily schedule is different. Uh, I have a friend who had that. He recently, like about two years ago, and he like eats one meal a day now. Uh huh. I don't know if yeah, you had something like that. Yeah. I have a cousin who has had esophageal cancer, so he can't swallow anything. But he's oh. got a tube that goes directly to his stomach, and they take like booster and sure, and just go that directly into his stomach through the tube. But and he got COVID having his tube cleaned because that's the only place. <sighs> he <can eat> <laughs> but. Uh, so that was bad, but I, I learned to live with it, learned to deal with it. And then I got lung cancer in 2019. And then for a little while there, I had two different kinds of lung cancer. In different, and uh, they dealt with that with chemo, with radiation. And then I thought that was all gone. And then I started having some different issues. I couldn't read, I couldn't write. Uh, I had trouble just walking around, losing my balance. It turned out that the first lung cancer had come back now in my brain. And uh, so that's what I'm dealing with now. I've had radiation for that. And those problems have gone away. I have lost my voice, which nobody seems to be able to explain. I lost it completely, but I'm hoarse. So uh, I'm learning to deal with that. I'm tired a lot. So, uh, And you, so if there's that's anybody that's entitled to be tired, it's you, man. Well, thank you. Seriously. I, I just sit down and sometimes I'll close my eyes and then I'll open on this an hour later and what have I been doing? I don't know. I guess I was asleep. I go into this sort of suspended animation, kind of like you do in a long plane flight. Sure. When you can't sleep, really, but you're not awake either. So that happens from time to time. But as long as I stay focused, I stay awake. Like now. I think. Wow. Um. I want to try to uh, have a follow-up question. I'm trying to think of which one I want to ask. And, and to be honest, how to ask it. Uh, is there any, what did you learn about anything from this? Yeah, I'm not, and I'm not looking for a rosy answer, just a sincere, you know, like what, what, I can't imagine going through anything like this. What well, imagine, you know, as I'm an older guy, I remember all these old words we were talking about. Uh, they were once part of my language. So I turned 70 this year, which is amazing in itself. Yeah. And uh, I think about, oh, gee, I remember when my uncle was 70 or when my dad was 70. They're all gone now. 
And, you know, I, I'm not going to be around forever either. Yeah. But, you know, it's all natural. It's like my mother used to say, death is an important part of life. She had a lot of things like that. And uh, you realize, start thinking about it. It's a grim thing to think about. Yes. I, mean, I want to stay alive, of course. But uh, I've also had, uh, like my father and my uncle, I've had some people sent me some pretty good examples for how to live this portion of my life. So uh, I've learned a lot from them. I can't put it in words exactly even. I say this is the lesson I learned from my uncle. But uh, part of it was with him they had him in a hospital bed in his living room and went to visit him. It's up in Orangeville, North Carolina. And uh, he just lit up when I came in the door. How are you doing? What have you been up to? Tell me about this. How's this in your life? And it was all about me. <coughs> Excuse me. He wasn't lying there complaining about, oh, my back hurts. Oh, I'm going to die. There's none of that. It was all about how are you doing? It's so good to see you. And then, so we sat and visited for a while and then he just said, uh, it's been great to see you. And now I got to tell you, I'm really tired and I need to roll over and sleep a little bit. And I said, of course. And uh, I've used that one a few times. I learned that one from him. <laughs> uh, but, uh, I still don't know if I can put in, into words what the, the lesson was I learned from him there, but it, just to uh, respect other people and pay more attention to them than you do to yourself, which is also something Mark and I would do in Delta Moon, back to guitars. Uh, we would do these double slide vocals, I mean, double slide solos. And uh, Not everybody does that. In fact, just a couple of weeks ago, uh, AJ Jan, there's a great Sacred Steel player. I don't know if you're familiar with him. I, I know his name. Yeah, Sacred Steel. You know who I heard him from? Uh, he turned, um, I've had too many people on my show, Robert Randolph. Yeah. Was, yeah. He, so Robert, I was, when Robert was on the show, he mentioned him. Might have been his father or his grandfather. He's like third generation. Yes. Sacred Steel player. And uh, he'll say, so my father would play this this way, but my grandfather would play it this way, but I'm going to play it this way. <laughs> so, you know, uh, but uh, anyway, he was saying, how do you guys do that when you're doing a double slide solo? And I said, you know, my theory is to pay more attention to what the other guy's doing than to what you're doing yourself. And then it comes out and you listen back to it on a recording or a video and you say, how in the world do we get into that? <laughs> What's going on? So, but it's not like you did it on purpose. It's not like you're so wonderful. You just got into this conversation and this thing started happening. So, yeah. uh, so maybe that's what I'm saying about my uncle Bob. And maybe that's what it's true in, in music too. Just pay more attention to the other guy yeah. or girl as it should be, to the other person. Um, thank you for sharing all that, man. And sure. Yeah, man. And I obviously goes without saying, I just wish you nothing, but, uh, thanks. I hope at least some of it was coherent. It was all coherent. <laughs> it's just kind of rambling. Yeah. Now you hit a home run there, man. It was all a hundred percent. Uh, but thank you. And I, of course I wish you nothing, but you know, thank you. The best of recovery and, 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 and positive vibes, man. I appreciate it uh let's switch gears all right it's hard to do that i'm sorry it, it's so heavy man yeah that was a pretty heavy gear <laughs> <laughs> that was pulling up the steep you know. best tell me two or three of the best concerts you've seen 
Uh, the first one that really slayed me, absolutely slayed me, was Creedence. Oh, man. 69. Yeah. Creedence slayed me. And I'd seen a lot of good bands that year. But, Where'd you uh, see them? Atlanta Pop Festival. Mm. First Atlanta Pop Festival. Also, Led Zeppelin played so many good bands. Yeah, Zeppelin played there. The Allman Brothers. Uh, gosh. The, so they were at the second one. The Allman yes. Brothers. But I saw them that fall. They used to play Piedmont Park here in Atlanta for free. I'm for saying. free, yeah, I heard about that. <laughs> yeah, I was down there. I was, I was a regular. But uh, I'd have to say, as far as that was all great, and I loved all those shows. And I was seeing during those years four or five bands a week. I was seeing. That's all I did was go see bands. Uh, but I'd have to say my next really big show that just thrilled me to the core was Ry Cooter Chicken Skin Music Review with uh, he had Flacco and Menes on the uh, accordion. He had Gabby Pahanui on acoustic guitar. He, he pulled all these people from all over the world. And uh, what a band, what a sound. I just loved it. All right, let's talk about guitars. What is your go-to guitar right now? And what it other depends two? depends on what I'm doing. OK. It really depends on what I'm doing. I've got this Pro Tools set up in the dining room, and I've got what? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven guitars surrounding my desk. Right on. Pretty, uh, my go-to guitar there in Delta Moon became uh, two that were very similar. Uh, Harmony Stratotones from the early 50s. Oh, man, there's those, when you get the right ones, those are magic, yeah. man. I got one and uh, it sounded so cool. And then I got another one. And I had to fool with it for about six months before it got to sound like the first one. Uh, well, they have no truss rods, and that causes a lot yeah, of... Yeah, it's a baseball bat. Yeah. And in the lap steel, you don't need the truss rod. True. I had a, I've got a third one uh, that I just wanted to play as a regular electric guitar. And I had a truss rod put in it. It was still very difficult to play. In fact, Mark Johnson told me, this is before I had the trust rod put in. He said, don't ever bring that on stage again. <laughs> <laughs> uh, How do you really feel? <laughs> yeah. Uh, it, uh, well, as you put a capo on it, boy, it all just went out of whack. Yeah. And, uh, but they sound so cool. When they're hot, when they're on, it's yeah. the best, just the best, man. Yeah. So I'm a big fan of that one. Uh, it's the one that's over there leaning against my desk right now. Well, right behind me here, I've got a Oahu Tone Master, which I truly love. This is a great one. That's very. What is it? What's the, what is it? Oahu. Oahu. Yeah, got like you. the island, like yeah, like Tone like uh, Hawaii. Oahu Oahu Tone yeah, Okay. Yeah. It's a Hawaiian guitar. And uh, <coughs> I went back in the 80s. My old friend Mark Richardson and I, I, think I can turn off that email. Quit getting, let's hope it quits dinging. Uh, my friend Mark Richardson has since passed away, and I went into uh, Gruen Guitars in Nashville, and they had about 20 something lap steels. And we sat down in the little room there and uh, played all of them. And we, wow. It was like, okay, that one goes in the good pile. This one goes in the forget pile. Uh, so they, it was a pass fail. And then there were about seven that were passes. I mean, that, that they passed. They were good guitars. Yeah. When we came back to them and went through all seven of them, again, sorting into two piles. And then we went through a third time and there was only one 
that was at the top, and that was just a lot. So I still play it quite a lot. And I think it was about 125 bucks, something like that. Oh, that's a good deal, man. Yeah, well, they cost more now, but yeah, that was value for money for sure. And then, okay, I'll just tell you what I got here. Yeah, man. Next to that, I got this old uh, Harmony Roy Smeck. That's a beautiful guitar, man. Look at that. You don't see uh, black finishes like that. Well, long. actually, it's a midnight blue with little gold flecks in it, but you can't really see. No, it. you can't. It's beautiful, man. I don't. That's it's gorgeous. A little dusty now, but anyway, uh, and it's uh, got that old, you know, that speed bump pickup. Was it a P thirteen? Uh, that was Gibson. When they came out with the P90, sold all their supply of that pickup to Harmony. So they went in Harmony guitars after that. Um, and then I've got my go-tos for an acoustic guitar. It's also a Harmony, an acoustic uh, Harmony Sovereign. It just sounds great. And both of those were rebuilt by... Uh, Scott Baxendale in Athens, Georgia. I don't know if you're familiar with Scott. He'd be a great guest for your program. He, he uh, rebraces these old guitars. What's his last name, Scott? Baxendale. B-A-X-E-N-D-A-L-E. -E. He uh, takes these old guitars. A lot of them, you can't find that wood anymore. You just can't get that wood anymore. Right. It was just in a harmony or a cheap K or something in the old days. He takes them. He's really studied uh, pre-war Martin bracing. He's got a lot of theories, which will go into in depth sometimes if you let him. But uh, he takes the guitar apart and rebuilds it and uses his bracing that's based on the pre-war Martins. And... Uh, he had this whole thing about why is this 1939 Martin sound so much better than this identical 1940 Martin? What's going on here? So open them up and find out. <laughs> you know, that's sort of wow. You got to be that's a labor of love, man. You <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but he uh, he he rebuilt both of these for me, the two harmonies. And actually, yeah, the Stratotones are harmony too. I'm kind of harmonic. That's right. What are you what are you playing through most of the time, amp wise? On stage these days, I use a I say these days, it's been over a year. Um, for a a really small amp for a solo gig, I use a uh, it's a savage a little, I think it's a single 12. Okay. And it's got Tremolo, it's got, re uh, but no reverb. And, uh, but with the band, I would use uh, the uh, Vibralux, 210 yeah. uh, custom Vibralux that Fender's making now, except my guy, Jeff Bakos, who does all my amp work, he does something to it. He's, he, he says, I know what Tom likes. Somebody said, well, what did you do to Tom's amp to make it sound like that? He says, I know what Tom likes. There you That's go. All say. He the even, wizard. That's the yeah, wizard. He, he won't even tell me what he did. He's not letting you behind the curtain. Yeah. So we'd go over to Europe and I'd rent a, a custom Vibralux. Same amp. Of course, it's European uh, electricity, which is different. Totally. And uh, so that might make a big difference, but they sound pretty different. When you come home, a bass player, Fran or Joseph would say, that's the sound I remember. <laughs> yeah, man. So, uh, so I use that also on stage for many years. I used a, a 64 Viber, Viberver blackface with, mm -hmm. with a 15 inch JBL on it. And that thing sounded great. Just one fifteen. Yeah, man. You know, I have a, a PV Delta Blues amp. It's one fifteen. Yeah. Oh, it's it's the such a good amp, man. Yeah, it's got reverb, tremolo, dirt, 
channel. I mean, it's like pretty perfect. 30 watts. I mean, it's 15 I'm, to me makes a great guitar. It's really good. Yeah. I went to the uh, Fiberlux after uh, once again, it was, well, it was a festival in Denmark, and uh, that's what they had for their uh, back line. And uh, I went to pick it up. I thought it was going to weigh like a Bible. Driver verb with a 15 and nose. Just like, whoa, that's <laughs> light. <laughs> so, uh, oh, transistor it's right here. No, it's not transistor. It's all tube, but it's just a, for some reason, two tins is way cheaper, way lighter than a 15. Than one 15. Yeah. Okay. I gotcha. Um, what's the last piece of music you listened to most recently? I've been listening to a lot of my own, and I've got to say what I've been listening to lately, my wife drives me around now. I'm not allowed by the doctors to drive. So uh, what have we been listening to? Steve Reich. Yeah, <laughs> we've been listening to Steve Reich, which is not guitar at all. It's uh, marimbas mostly. Uh, Seems like there are some other things I was listening to at home. Oh, well, I've been taking apart some old Ray Charles songs too. You mentioned your own stuff. You told me you got 10 studio, two live albums. First of all, congratulations. That's a nice freaking catalog, man. There's a lot of work well, in that. Thank you. I, uh, really is. I hope you're right. I trust you're right. I haven't counted. And I trust Wikipedia's right. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but you told me 2007, Clear Blue Flame. You're really proud of that one. I like that one. Uh, tell me it, why. Part of it was, it started out just to be a demo session. And uh, it was me and Mark. And uh, we did a couple demos, me and Mark and a drummer named Tyler Greenwell, who plays with, uh... oh, geez, what's wrong with me? It's the brain cancer, I guess. Uh, Susan Tedeschi's husband. Derek Trucks. Derek Trucks. Derek. Hey, let me tell you something. Don't feel bad. Let me, you know what? I don't have anything that I know of. I mean, I don't know. And I've just like had so many guys on my show and I don't, I, I can't remember shit. Uh, and I'm like, like i think i'm a reasonably sharp person but you get to a point you got so much stuff in your head man at least is what i tell my kids because dad you told me this already and then i talked to a guy the other day say well just tell him you thought about it a second time <laughs> i just i wasn't telling you again i just thought about it i wanted to tell you again <laughs> it was intentional <laughs> so that's so again, that we, had, we had uh tyler greenwell on drums who's playing with uh, Derek trucks now wasn't then, but is now. And uh, did some uh, few songs with him and another old friend, Chris Long, uh, who used to play in uh, a band here in Atlanta called uh, King Johnson with Oliver Wood of the Wood Brothers. And uh, I learned a lot from Chris. He uh, bought backup vocals, because up to that point in Delta Moon, we had women. Yeah, they sounded great, man. Yeah, but it always on stage, it was like a competition. They were trying to outsing me and stand in front of me and stuff. And, you know, I'm willing to back up and let somebody else. That's your band. <laughs> and they were trying to stand in front of you. <laughs> yeah, this happened. Uh, That's pretty funny, actually. I mean, like funny, not in a funny way. <laughs> like, yeah. you know. No, it actually got to the point of air pulling one night in Charlotte. Wow. But anyway. I know, on stage. That's like you're a side man and you're telling the artist, step aside. You know, I mean, it's like something's wrong about that, man. Guy, guy at the, uh, uh, yeah, guy when I came off stage said, you two are married, right? <laughs> no. <laughs> I can understand how it looked like that. Uh, but uh, at any rate, Chris didn't sound like that. He sang, he sang back up. His voice got behind mine if I'm singing lead. That was a new experience for me. Yeah. Um, but 
then we went, we had just a few songs like that, but it's two and then. And then, uh, then we got a chance to go in the studio one afternoon. So let's just cut a few demos with Tyler. They call him the Falcon. And uh, Ted Pecchio, who he played with quite a lot. Ted, uh, last time I saw him, he was playing with who? We'd run into him at festivals. He was we playing with J.J. Gray. And then he was playing with uh, another guy whose name I can't remember, but you would know him because he's a big guitar hero. Anyway, <laughs> but, sorry. Johnny Cash taught me to remember that I should remember people's names. But, oh, believe me. It is, honestly, man, it's hard. I'm not just saying that to blow smoke. It is really hard. And you kind of uh, honor him. Guy, uh, oh, Doyle. Doyle Bramall, the second. Yes, yes. yes. He was playing with him. That was over in Spain the last time I saw Ted. But we, uh, I love playing festivals and backstage are all these people you know. It's just so cool just hanging out. But anyway, that's beside the point. Uh, we got in there with Tyler and Ted and just started cutting songs. And I, what I thought was going to take all day. We got done in an hour and a half and they're saying, what else you got? What else you got? We don't need to hear that back. We got it. What else you got? So uh, I started pulling out more songs and they all sounded great with those guys. And I'd say, I got this one. I'm not quite sure about what kind of feel to put under this. And they said, well, why don't I do this, says Ted. Tyler says, well, if you do that, I'll do this. And it's like, OK, it's a record. And uh, so we got cut way more than I expected to get cut that day and said, well, we only need a few more songs to make this an album. What are y'all doing tomorrow? <laughs> so we came back in the next day and cut several other songs. And we had an album just like that. And it's got that, it's just got a rough and ready spirit to it that I really like. It's got a nice rock and roll spirit and, a, and an edge to the sound. It was like, it was just let's go for it. We're uh, halfway through the thing and the engineer says, you know what, I have a bad cable on one of the, uh... no, I think we we're done. And he said, I discovered I had a bad cable on one of the uh, overhead mics. So it's, it's making this flippy flippy sound the whole time. And we're saying, ah, that's OK. We'll just have uh, the overhead mono instead of stereo. We're fine with that. <laughs> and he said, well, OK, if you are, I am. So uh, that was the whole spirit of that album. That's you got a song on there called Cool Your Jets. I really like that tune. Man. Oh, thank you. The whole record was great, but I, really, I like that song. You know, it was, I guess, my favorite track on the record. It's a really nice record, man. Thanks very much. So it came together. It was like you weren't expecting to make an album like that that quick. Right. We, were thought, yeah. we thought we'd just demo a few songs. But That's we got great. done so quickly. And the guys were so hot to just keep going and do some more. But uh, we ended up pulling out all kinds of things. That's great, man. Do you have a worst gig ever story? <laughs> I'd have to go back. It's okay. First, let me just tell this one story in preface to that. Uh, some friends of mine in Nashville <laughs> were working with this guy who did a lot of fraternity gigs there at the college there. And, uh, I saw one of them and he said, uh, I was the bass player and he said, I had the best gig of my life last night. Some drunk frat guy got on stage and puked all over the singer. <laughs> <laughs> it was the best <laughs> ever. Yeah. Two hours later, I see this other guy, the guitar player, he said, I had the worst gig of my life last night. Some drunk fat guy, frat guy got on stage and puked all over the singer. <laughs> so, you know, uh, I think the best gig and the worst gig is all. That's so funny, man. Boulder there, yeah. That is really funny. Yeah, so it's all, it's all relative to uh, where you're at, what your mindset and yeah, position think, is. Yeah, I think the craziest gig, I'll just put it that way, 
was back in the 70s when I was playing those bars six nights a week. And this one bar had a guy who would come in and run a wet t-shirt contest, which I don't know if you kids will have to go to the library and look that up. Yeah. <laughs> we played Herbie Hancock's Chameleon for like an hour and a half solid. Wow. The wet t-shirt contest. <laughs> and Started out with these seven girls across from the stage. And after 45 minutes, they were all completely naked and shaking up beer bottles and spraying themselves. And it just got ruder and ruder from there. And it looked out in the audience. It wasn't an audience anymore. It's just wall-to-wall -wall fights at the whole club. <laughs> and the... Uh, Uh, the bouncer is this guy that he called Tiny, who is a former professional wrestler. Everybody's got a Tiny as a bouncer that's a former professional fighter, wrestler, yeah, boxer. It. It's hilarious, man. Yeah, yeah. You know, he was living right up to it, but he panicked and he called the police and it got on the radio. Not only did the police come, the fire department came. I think the dog catcher came, everybody. Yeah. Ambulance rescue guys, everybody. They were all there because it was insane. And the uh, club had to shut down for a couple of weeks. Unfortunately, with our gear locked inside, oh. we did finally get it back. Uh, <laughs> I think anybody who was there will tell you that was the weirdest gig of all time. Can you think they have something like that today? What would happen if you had a wet t-shirt contest uh, today? I don't know, but I doubt I would be playing that. <laughs> <laughs> hey, hey, give me your top three Desert Island discs. Oh, gee. <clears throat> That's a hard one for me to answer. I'm not sure I am. There's so many records I love. Just for right, just for this minute, right now. For right now, this minute, I would say Iggy Pop the Idiot. Uh, I would say what we were just talking about, Steve Wright, music for 18 musicians. That I could listen to on the Desert Island for a month. So uh, spell his last name. R is it right? Like R I G? -A? No, R E I C H. Right. Okay. More classical. More like in the uh philip k glass vein or branch but okay philip glass philip k glass philip glass but it's in that yeah in that area in that direction although it's mostly marimbas and various things it's not very melodic but i i just love it it's got a certain flavor his music uh steve reich that's a man not philip Steve Wright. What oh, you I said thinking? Steve Wright. You said that? Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah you said Steve Wright. Philip K. Dick for a minute there. I'm no, not... no, that's the writer. Yeah, I know. I know. Uh, so, and okay, I'm looking in the mirror here, which is my computer. And this, Blues by Basie. I don't know if it's ever been on an album. I've got it in sheet music and on a 45. I mean, I'm not on 45s, on 78s. Wow. An old time album that you would, you know, like leaf through to get out the separate. Yeah, room. yeah. And uh, I could listen to bassy small groups forever. And, uh, and while we're at it, uh, Benny Goodman's six, Sextet, I could listen to that forever. Uh, so that's. And what's, what's Steve Reich's album, the title? I'm sorry. Uh, music for 18 out. Musicians is the one I would pick to go to a desert island. Okay. Uh, but uh, I, I just love, I love the uh, Benny Goodman small bands. Back when he couldn't have a black band, a black man in his main band. So he for started forming the Benny Goodman Quartet, Quintet, Sextet. Sextet yeah. And he's got, then he's got, uh, he's got uh, 
Teddy Wilson on piano. He's got Charlie Christian on guitar. Uh, he's got, uh, you know, he can have these black guys in his band here, yeah. in the small bands. Yeah. And of course, he's got Gene Krupa on drums. It's just the whole band is is a who's who. And then I'll have also some guests, and his his guest players are fantastic. Usually black guys, Johnny Hodges on sax, something like that. It's, they're just wonderful records. I love those. And then, and my favorite actually is the one. Uh, He's got, uh, what she, I think, then about 17, 18 years old, Peggy Lee singing uh, Where or When. That's just one of my all time favorite records. I could listen to that one for a month on the Desert Island, just that one song. What an eclectic Iggy Pop, Steve Reich, Blues by Basie, and Benny Goodman, man. That's pretty diverse. I'm a diverse guy. Yeah, man. Who's, uh, who's your hero? I can't say that I've got one. I'm fortunate I ought to have one. Uh, you think people are your heroes and then you read their biographies and you realize, well, <laughs> maybe not. Up as I am. <laughs> oh, and everybody's messed up, man. It's just yeah. what the, to, you know, as long as you operate within the degree of dysfunction where it's, you know, acceptable, it's, it's acceptable. It's cool. You know, yeah. we, everybody's, struggling with something you know that's for sure yeah so i'm not sure i've got an answer on who is my hero this is interesting now what do you like most about yourself yeah, i like so many different things kinds of music instruments different people i'm mostly a positive guy like Let me that. tell you, you certainly are, man, without a doubt. Well, thank you. Especially, I'll tell you what, man, in, in today's day and age, where people get on social media and bitch about everything from somebody didn't return my phone call, it's so wrong, to why is my shipping delayed? Oh, yeah. You know, I, that's really like, Man, get some coping skills, man. If you can, if that's, and if you have feel that compelled that you can't handle that and that you got to blast something like that out to lots of people. Like when I read that, I want to send somebody a bill for my time that right. they've just wasted that I could never get back. You and, know? And as far as you mentioned the shipping, why is my shipping delayed? In Delta Moon, we, uh, my wife mostly hands, handles it, uh, but we had to do the shipping out of our house. And uh, I got an email one time from a guy said, I paid for next day delivery. Here it is the next day and I haven't got it. Man, this ain't Amazon. <laughs> well, no, it's like, I look back. We paid for next day delivery at 6 p.m. And now it's 10 a.m. and he's in Arizona and I'm in Atlanta. And he said, what haven't I got it yet? I mean, you know, we tried to be reasonable. I just ended up taking next day shipping option out of the store. I said, I never want to get this. That's what I'm saying, store. man. Like, can you imagine having that much time on your hands that uh, six, 16 hours? It's not Amazon. He knows it's just a guy and his house is shipping stuff out from I mean, Atlanta to Arizona. Yeah, but how stupid do you have to be to like, even get that thought into your head? Like, why would you do that? Surely you got something else you can do. That's just a little better use of your time, man. I, this is what I don't get. His own little web store and ship things out himself and see what it's like. Yeah. Right. No, he wouldn't do that. Cause then how could he do? But that's, and that's the thing. People that bitch never do anything except bitch. You know, so, so yeah, you are a positive guy, man. I'll tell you right now, because you're not on, you're a guy who has every right to be complaining about stuff that may not be fair, you know? So yeah, you're a real positive guy, man. Well, thank you. For sure. Um, sorry, my rant's over. <laughs> <laughs> if this guy's watching your show. Yeah, you know. dude, don't order anything at all. Turn the channel, you know, do not 
pass go 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 directly to do not collect two hundred dollars whatever the hell uh tell me your best childhood memory tom my best childhood memory oh there are quite a lot i can't rank them maybe and this sounds stupid because why would this be the best memory it doesn't mean anything but i remember summertime and i'm a kid an elementary school kid and it's summer and i'm walking up to the hardware store to buy some baseball cards maybe i'd buy them at the drugstore but at any rate i just remember walking in the sun and there's this great big cat that stretched out across the sidewalk and his back feet are on one end of the side of the sidewalk off the sidewalk on the grass and his front paws are off the sidewalk on the other side. And I don't know why, when I try to think back of a pleasant memory from childhood, that picture always comes back to me. I can think what, so it, great, smelled, what it smelled like, what it felt like, what it looked like. Uh, so that's cool, that's, man. It's meaningless, I, but there it is. No, animals are wonderful, man. I, I mean, you know, they're just like awesome. Well, I could see that being, I could easily see that. Yeah, man uh who's had the biggest influence on you musically and also personally personally i have to say my family has been a huge influence i was very lucky to choose the right parents <laughs> <That's> <laughs> credit for <laughs> and then all uh the and then the larger family that came after that and uh uh my siblings, my cousins, my uncles and aunts, of course, my grandparents, my grandfather, one grandfather I never knew, but but every, from everything I've been told, there was no dark side to that man. That's awesome. <laughs> so I don't know. I've been very fortunate there. Uh, so I'll give them all credit. Let's see. Did I answer too much? Music. No, no, no. Mu now musically, who's, who, who, who's been your biggest, biggest influence? I have to say there have been quite a few because my interests have ranged pretty widely. Yeah. And uh, so I might have picked up a lot from the Ramones and I might have picked up a lot from Duke Ellington, you know, and, and uh, I figured out at a certain point in my life that it's not just nostalgia that all the music of the 20th century has been recorded. No generation before us at that time was as lucky as we were. Yeah. To have cool. all of that, to have all of that, all the 50s jazz, all the 60s rock and roll, uh, the 30s swing, all of that right at our fingertips. So I listened to all of it. Uh, the blues, of course. I used to pick up uh, blues 78s a lot here around where I live now in Decatur, Georgia. I mean, and I think I found more in Decatur than I did in Atlanta, but at pawn shops and there'd be little tag sales where they just have stuff out on the table and uh, find all these old Muddy Waters records on Aristocrat and Chess. And, uh, B.B. King on RPM. Uh, this old stuff that most people don't even know existed or at that time didn't know existed. Sure. And uh, so I, I just loved that. And uh, I didn't know, I remember listening to Muddy Waters' Honeybee and not knowing how he's getting that sound. I thought maybe he was bending a string, but that was a long way to bend a string to get it to moved down that much and it was just the sound just drove me nuts and then later i learned he was playing it with a uh, bottleneck but yeah. uh, so and then a lot of on the lap steel particularly a lot of uh, older players i learned and i'm still learning everything i can from people I mentioned aj gent earlier in the uh, terms of the sacred steel, I actually started some, taking some online lessons from him. 
He said, wait till I tell my wife I had Tom from Delta Moon. That's so cool. <laughs> I've been, I've been uh, just, because I, I, there's a, another Sacred Steel player who plays mostly just locally here. I've been to his church and he was playing some in clubs around here. We played together on the radio, uh, Dante Harmon. And uh, I hear him do this stuff and I say, how does he do that? He just does it. It's in him. That sound comes out. And uh, it's like Tiger Woods playing golf. These guys are starting like four years old, man. They're just, yeah, it's hard to recreate that when you're starting something that young and you're so deep in it from day one, especially somebody like AJ, whose father played in the church and his father played in the church. Right. And he just grew up in it. Yeah. Says, they never sat me down and said, okay, here's how to do this. They never gave me one lesson, but I grew it up, grew up hearing it every day. Yeah. It was just going on. So uh, I'm learning, I'm making him stop. Show me that. What is that? Uh, now you just tune that string down a step. What's going on? But uh, so we've been picking some records, some Ray Charles records. And uh, Drowned in My Own Tears has been the one we've been working on the most. Just uh, working it out on steel guitar. But he's, of course, Ray sang it in C sharp, which is not a good key for us. For but guitar we, players, no. Well, yeah, and not for lap steel players either. Unless they want to tune to C sharp, which we don't. So, we, uh, but we're actually doing it, I think, in D. But, um, and then he, uh, but I've learned a ton from him because he is trying to sound like a vocalist, or I've always tried to sound like a guitarist on the lap steel. So maybe some some lick that I would do across three different strings. He would do all on one string, and uh, a very different approach. And then also he's listening to different people. I brought up right. Lee Charles, and he was into that. And I brought up, you know, learning some Aretha stuff off her records. But then he'll say, and here's the Whitney lick, and then she'll do this. And I said, I never listened to Whitney Houston for my guitar licks. Uh, but maybe I should, because it sounds great when he does. So uh, I'm, I'm still learning every day. Oh, That's I'm awesome. Do you ever hear of this guy, Jim Kimo West? On, on, he's a slack key. Yeah, I know the name. I don't really know. Yeah. He, he's he's got an interesting background. He played. He's been Al Yankovic's guitar player for thirty years. Got Grammys wow. with Al, and then he's got Grammys on his own for his slack key work. Uh -huh. Really wild. I mean, totally. You know, total different. You know, nothing that you'd expect. Yeah, I love the slack key stuff. I, I think I mentioned Gabby Palanui. Yeah, and he played left steel too, and then uh, several other of those guys. Greg Lee's, I'm sure. Yeah, I'm thinking some Hawaiian guys like Ledward Kaapana is just, he's totally off the charts. He's totally undisciplined. He'll go anywhere, but he just does it with such mastery. He's a great player. Uh, so anyway, I do, I've always been interested in many kinds of music and learning everything I could. Do you have any hobbies outside of music? Do you have any hobbies outside of music? Uh, well, I still, I can't call it a hobby. I still write. I keep a journal every day. Do you really? You've been doing that a long time. Uh, off and on. The last couple of years, I've been doing it pretty much on. I think since I got sick the last time. I miss a day here and there, but not Sure. And uh, it's a lot of discipline to do that. Yeah, it is. But it, as long as I enjoy it, I'm sure. Ready. Yeah, it's like a, like I said mentioned earlier, it's a labor of love, you know. Yeah. yeah. If you if you enjoy looking, if you look forward to writing in your journal every day, yeah, it's cool. Yeah. Uh, just a couple more questions, Tom, sure. and thank you for everything, man. Sure. Appreciate you being so candid and so open. Thank you, man. Toughest decision you had to make.
I don't know about that one. I haven't got a good answer there because most decisions I've made, even though they've been unpleasant sometimes, I came to from trying to reason out what is the best thing to do. And sometimes the best thing to do is very tough. Mm -hmm. But uh, by the time I've already made them, I, th I know they're what I have to do. So I can't, I can't really tell you what the toughest decision is. Fair enough. Uh, biggest change in your personality over the last 10 years and how much of that change has been intentional and how much has just been a part of aging? I don't know. I might have to ask my wife about that. Uh, at least the first part of it. I've, uh, in the last 10 years, as I've grown older, I'm, uh, I used to say, let's go, let's get on the road, let's go right now. Uh, sometimes it's been wonderful and sometimes it's led me into trouble. Uh, right now, I'm perfectly happy not being on the road, even though I love being places. I love the people. I love seeing people. And I love performing. Uh, I'm also okay just hanging around the house right now. That may change. But that's just where I am right now. And then uh, last one, any final words of wisdom? Oh, I've got no words of wisdom. <laughs> yeah, just, sure you do, man. No, don't be scared. Just fake it. Jump on out there. That's, uh, that was perfect. Don't be scared. Just jump on out there. That is a, uh, a great way to end this. And I want to thank you and tell people um, where to find you. So I would love everybody, if you're not familiar with Delta Moon, to check out uh, Delta Moon and Tom Gray. So Tom has some new music coming out soon, and I would love everybody to follow him on Facebook. It's Tom Gray Music. Facebook, YouTube, and Instagram, all of them. It's Tom Gray Music and G-R-A-Y. That's how he spells yeah, his last name. And maybe on the on one of them. Yeah, it's on Facebook. I'm Tom Gray Music number one. But I think if you search for Tom Gray music and you find this picture. Find the ball guy. Yeah. Uh, but there's some some kid in Australia, I think, already snagged Tom Gray music. So I don't have it. Look for the distinguished looking gentleman. That's, that's the right one. And also, uh, you can go to Tom's website at tomgraymusic.com. Uh, if you're not familiar with Delta Moon, uh, they have an extensive catalog, like I said, 10 studio albums, two live records. Man, there's there, there's you know, there's so many good songs in the last record, Babylon is falling long way to go. I love was great. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, um, low down the title track was phenomenal. Let me That's go to some weight song. Yeah. Oh, it's a great cool. Your version is great. Cool. Your jets was great, man. The, you know, it was cool. Uh, the first preaching blues, the first song on your first record. I love your first record, man. You can't make somebody love you fooling around big road blues. Wang Dang Doodle, of course, a cover, but your version was great, man. Um, if you like blues, you got to listen to these guys, man. They're just uh, champions of the blues and carrying the torch. And anything else? I think we've covered a lot of ground. I can't we, think of anything. <laughs> but that we have, and thank you. <laughs> hey, man, uh, I want to thank you very much for everything. I wish you nothing but great health and great vibes and positive stuff, and uh, I look forward to listening to your new music when it comes out. Well, thank you very much, Craig, and I'll let you know. Please do. Among the first. Please, thank you very much for your time. Please do. Hang on one second, and we'll wrap up. Everybody, thank you so much for listening. If you enjoy this, share it on your socials with your friends. We appreciate your support. Thanks very much to Tom Gray. Check out TomGrayMusic.com and uh, Delta Moon for some great blues. And uh, the, your, the brains, I checked them out on YouTube. That's If you're like alt punk stuff, man, is they're all there for you, man. It's waiting for you. And you got two albums and an EP. The brains, yeah. Yeah. Is that on? Uh, that's going to be on on apple music or spotify or whatever i'm assuming correct no it's not at this time and i've been working on getting it reissued 
I've got a, uh, should have told you about that. I kind of dropped everything when I got cancer this last time and it's time I'm starting picking things up again. Um, <laughs> I'm yeah. laughing because you're like, you're almost apologetic about, well, I got cancer, so I had to drop it. It's good, man. It's all right. You know? <laughs> uh, uh, so it's okay, yeah. you get, you but, get a pass. <laughs> uh, I, I put together an album's worth of stuff, which includes the EP that we did on landslide and, uh, the two some Mercury recordings. Okay. There were some early four track recordings that we did in my bedroom. And uh, that, and that'll be uh, because I don't have rights to the stuff that was on Mercury. But I've got a good lawyer, and I'm hoping that once we can prove that we've got some interest, uh, the brains are on Facebook, the brains are on Instagram. I got to start posting regularly again as I pick myself up here. But uh, if I can show them that I got the social media in interest, then I think we stand a much better chance of re releasing those old records. Right on. So follow the brains on Facebook and like their Instagram page and support uh, this quest here to get some brains music out there, man. Uh, and most important, Remember that happiness is a choice, so choose wisely. Be nice, go play a guitar, and have fun. Till next time, peace and love, everybody. Tom, thank you so much for everything, brother. I appreciate it. You're welcome, Craig. Thank you very much. You got it, man.